On October 12, 1972, Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571 took off from Montevideo, Uruguay, with 45 people, including 40 passengers and five crew members on board. The passengers were old Christians Club amateur rugby team players, their friends and family, who were traveling to Santiago, Chile, for an exhibition match. The plane, however, soon had to make a landing in Mendoza, Argentina, where it stayed overnight due to bad weather. The next day, on its way to Santiago, the plane went through the snowy Andes. About an hour into the flight, the pilot thought they had reached the destination and began to descend with clearance from air traffic controllers, who didn't realize that he was wrong. When the plane descended, it crashed directly into the Andes, splitting the aircraft apart. They were hurled through the air as if caught in a hurricane, stunned and dizzy. As the plane struck the mountain and tumbled down its side with deafening explosions, it seemed to slide at supersonic speed. They realized with dread that the aircraft had crashed into the Andes and death was imminent. Resigned, they bowed their heads, awaiting the final blow that would cast them into oblivion. In the chilling heights of the Andes, a story of survival against all odds began to unfold. Out of 45 people on the plane, 12 were tragically lost in the crash. The harsh first night claimed five more lives, and a week later, another person passed away, leaving 27 survivors to face unimaginable challenges. Using quick thinking, these survivors turned the remains of their plane into a makeshift shelter. They built a wall out of suitcases to keep the snow out. They found some food supplies in the wreckage and shared them equally, but it only lasted for a week. As hunger grew unbearable, they first tried to eat pieces of leather from their luggage. But soon, they had to make a decision that was beyond imagination. They chose to survive by eating meat from those who had died in the crash. This tough choice showed their incredible will to live, marking a story of endurance and the human spirit's strength in the most extreme conditions. Four survivors, each armed with a razor blade or a shard of glass, took on the grim task with a heavy heart. They carefully removed the clothing from a body, whose face they could not bring themselves to look at, a testament to the emotional turmoil that plagued them. Thin strips of frozen flesh were meticulously laid aside on a piece of sheet metal, a makeshift preparation area in their dire circumstances. Consuming their allocated piece required a monumental effort, a battle between survival instinct and human sentiment. Each survivor, in their own time, managed to overcome their reluctance, driven by the primal urge to live. As if the narrative of survival couldn't be etched with deeper shades of despair, the saga took a darker turn around ten days post-crash. The survivors, clinging to a sliver of hope, unearthed a small transistor radio from the wreckage. The static-laden voice from the radio delivered a crushing blow. The search operation had been abandoned, and they were all presumed dead. This news cast a shadow over their already dimming hope, marking a somber chapter in their struggle for life. The seventeenth day brought another cruel blow as an avalanche thundered down on the fuselage where the survivors sought shelter. Those asleep on the floor were swiftly entombed in snow, and eight more lives were tragically claimed that fateful night. The sheer force of nature completely buried the aircraft, leaving only a narrow gap of air near the ceiling to sustain the remaining occupants. With each passing moment, the specter of suffocation loomed ever closer. In a desperate bid for survival, Parado summoned all his strength and resourcefulness. Using a metal pole salvaged from the luggage racks, he managed to breach one of the cockpit windscreens, allowing a precious influx of fresh air. Yet, their newfound relief was short-lived as a relentless blizzard held them captive inside, surrounded by the silent reminders of their fallen comrades. Faced with the grim inevitability of starvation, they made a haunting decision. Casting aside the bounds of taboo, they turned to the only source of sustenance available to them, the bodies of their deceased companions. It was a choice born of desperation, a grim testament to the unfathomable depths of human endurance in the face of despair. When the storm finally relented, they clawed their way through the snow, emerging from the wreckage into a desolate landscape. With no rescue in sight, they resolved to take matters into their own hands. Weeks of preparation followed, marked by arduous training and makeshift equipment crafted from the remnants of their former lives. As the 61st day dawned on their harrowing ordeal, hope flickered anew within the hearts of Canessa and two brave companions. Determined to defy the odds, they made a daring choice, to leave behind the safety of the fuselage where 13 others opted to remain. 
Guided by the fading words of the fallen pilot, who had revealed their location in the western reaches of the Andes, near Chile, a glimmer of possibility ignited within them. With the promise of civilization beckoning from the valleys below, the trio dared to entertain the audacious notion of scaling the towering peaks that stood as both barriers and beacons of hope. Yet, the path ahead was fraught with peril. The unforgiving terrain exacted a toll on their bodies as altitude sickness and bitter cold tested their resolve at every turn. Despite the odds stacked against them, they pressed onward, driven by the flickering flame of hope that burned within their hearts. In the dangerous Andes Mountains, three young men started a risky journey, feeling worried because they were running out of food. One of them, Antonio Vizintin, had to go back because they had no food left. But Roberto Canessa and Nando Parado didn't give up. They kept going, wearing lots of clothes to stay warm. Parado later said, I lost a lot of weight, my skin, my hair, even my shoes felt heavy. But we couldn't stop. They walked through tough terrain for days and nights, feeling a lot of pain, but also showing how strong people can be. Then, they saw a riverbank from a mountainside. Canessa saw a man on the other side of the river, Sergio Catalan, riding a horse. They yelled for help, but the noise of the river was too loud. So Catalan made a message on the stone and threw it to them. Parado quickly wrote a message asking for help because they were starving and trapped after a plane crash. Catalan gave them two loaves of bread and went to get more help from a town called Puente Negro. Parado and Canessa didn't know it, but their message reached rescue teams. Catalan had helped them, and soon rescuers arrived, bringing hope and ending their struggle for survival. On December 22nd, the military finally reached the crash site, but bad weather thwarted their efforts to airlift all the survivors immediately. Only six out of the 14 passengers were able to be rescued on the spot. Thankfully, the following day, the weather improved and the remaining survivors were safely picked up. Parado recalls that the rescuers couldn't believe they were the passengers from the plane that had crashed two and a half months earlier. The Chilean Air Force arrived with three Bell UH-1 helicopters to help with the rescue, and Fernando and Roberto informed the pilots about the whereabouts of their other companions. Parado used the pilot's chart to guide two of the helicopters, and the rescuers were amazed at how anyone could survive at the crash site for so long. One pilot told me that this was the worst flight of his life because they simply couldn't figure out where they were going, Parado said. After his hospitalization, during which they removed the clothes he had worn for 72 days, he returned home. When we got back to Uruguay, my companions in the mountains were welcomed by their families. I returned home and my father was in despair because he had lost his entire family. On October 13, 2022, Fernando Parado stated that he had no regrets about what had happened. Thanks to our friends, 16 of us survived. And now, along with our families, we are 140 people, he said. Word of the remarkable miracle in the Andes swiftly traversed the globe, capturing the attention and imagination of people far and wide. The initial jubilation surrounding the survivors' rescue, however, was soon overshadowed by a chilling revelation. As the truth emerged, shock and dismay rippled through communities worldwide. The survivors had resorted to consuming human flesh in order to endure their harrowing ordeal. They staunchly defended their actions. You can't feel guilty for doing something you didn't choose to do, Canessa asserted to the Washington Post in 1978. Nevertheless, the memory of cannibalism lingered with the survivors throughout the ensuing decades. Canessa reflected on this in his memoir, stating, For us, taking this leap was a final break, and the consequences were irreversible. We were never the same. Despite the eventual descent of 16 young men from the mountain, the bodies of those who perished remained intertwined with the unforgiving landscape of the Andes. They were laid to rest in the vicinity of their final moments, a somber testament to the enduring impact of their tragic journey. And that's a wrap for today's video. I understand that the subject matter might be complex, but I appreciate you sticking around. If you found value in what we discussed, a like and a subscription would mean a lot to me. It helps support the channel and allows us to keep diving into these important topics together. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.